The Moray Firth, a 5,000 km square bay on the northeast coast of Scotland, is special because of its dynamic mix of cold Arctic and warm Gulf Stream currents. It provides the backdrop to a fascinating study of the conflict between the needs of four large mammal species, one of which is man. Can man and marine mammals coexist? This fundamental question underpins the scientific studies being undertaken by Kevin Robinson and his research team. We're primarily working with the whales and dolphins in this area. And to date we've recorded 11 different species using these inner coastal waters. But there are three main species which we find in our UK coastal waters, namely the harbour porpoise, the minke whale and the bottlenose dolphins. The main three species that we're studying in these waters are all coastal species. And they're species which are living in that area of the coastline which is perhaps the most susceptible to human impacts. So in that respect, um, it's very important that we monitor their, their habitat use and how man-made influences are impacting upon their habitat. The Earthwatch Research Centre and the Cetacean Research and Rescue Unit are based in the tiny fishing village of Gardenstown on the southern shore of the Moray Firth. Thing. What are we looking for? Well, let's start from the very it is dedicated so to, to the conservation again. and protection of these whale well and dolphin species, okay. collectively yeah, sure. known as cetaceans. All three of the studied species are considered to be endangered both at a national level and in worldwide terms. With animals free to move huge distances through connected seas and oceans, the challenge of providing some form of protection or sanctuary is immensely complex. A further complication is the fact that the minke whale is hunted by neighbouring countries, Norway and Iceland. The Inner Moray Firth is one of only two areas within the UK where bottlenose dolphins breed and as such the welfare of these animals has to be considered in any developments along the coastline or at sea. Yep, yep, 119 and calf. 119 and calf. By carrying out long-term ongoing studies we can monitor the populations in this particular coastline and how they're using the particular habitats along here. So for example if um, somebody wanted to build a jet ski school in the next bay we may be able to have a bearing upon that and say well yeah, it's okay to, you know, jet skis are a recreational activity which may bring tourists to the area and they may be economically beneficial for the area. However, that particular bay, there are animals that show very high site fidelity for that bay and there may be other areas which would be better suited which the animals don't use as highly. The detailed work of Nina Baumgartner timing the dives of the minke whales may help to provide a more accurate model to estimate numbers of these creatures. I'm using very basic tools, very basic methods. I'm using photo identification so I just study the whales individually by looking at their fin, dorsal fins, and I follow them basically as much as I can to know a bit more about their behaviours and um, take photographs then and then take positions and then um, collect the data on their diving profiles which means I just use a stopwatch. Hello. 41 seconds and take data on the diving interval. Some of the threats that these species face include overfishing, naval activity, oil exploration and pollution. All of these factors and more affect the well-being of these creatures. But perhaps their biggest threat is our ignorance of their behaviour and needs. I gave you great hills. John Smith has fished these seas for over 40 years. He now runs puffin cruises and takes people on trips to see the whales, dolphins and bird life of the area. He has noticed the effects that oil exploration, seismic surveys have had on the cetaceans. One of the threats to the cetaceans is the seismic surveys I think. Uh, with an example of that last year there was a boat doing seismic surveys just off Fraserborough. We saw very little cetaceans when that boat was in the area. 
and it's going on all over the North Sea, big time the seismic survey, it affects the fish as well. Knowledge will ultimately be the key to these species' survival. As Kevin Robinson observes, he is no longer able to study the animals simply for interest. It is now an imperative for their survival. As scientists today, we no longer have the luxury of studying whales and dolphins simply to learn more about them. Now we must learn more about them simply to, to protect them. This and developing work to tag these whales could substantially undermine commercial whaling, often conducted for so-called scientific research. The current whaling nation's estimations assume that for every number of whales observed, there is a small number unobserved below the water. However, the cetacean unit and Earthwatch research has shown that minke whale dyes vary enormously according to all kinds of influences and that the current formula is overestimating well, the population the size. Such evidence could potentially sway arguments to protect many hundreds of whales each year. Minke whales are top predators in the food web. Therefore, I think by looking at the, if they're present in an area, that means that the whole ecosystem underneath them is healthy. That means that all the connections are working properly. If you don't see a whale or a dolphin, uh, that could be a worry because it means that there is no fish. That means that could mean that the seabed is destroyed. Could mean that it's too polluted and so forth. Cetacean's presence in healthy numbers is therefore an indicator of a sea rich in marine life. But even here there is a need for caution. A dolphin may live for 50 years, a minke whale for 60 years. Is their population being replaced or declining? Only scientific study will provide us with the answers. A combination of politics, technology and demand has changed beyond recognition the face of the fishing industry. Some small inshore boats still operate from most harbours, fishing for prawns, crab and mackerel. Whilst Fraserburgh, on the eastern estuary of the Firth, remains the home of the bulk of the Scottish deep water fleet. Within the working life of the older fishermen, the fleet has reduced from thousands of family drift net boats to a few dozen million pound super trawlers. Methods of fishing have changed over the years, as have the targeted species. William, a local fisherman, explains the extent to which the fishing industry has changed within his lifetime. Well, our fishing methods has changed uh, from drift net, which employed 10 guys and a lot, a lot, a lot of manual labour, to the sufficient boats that we've got now, and there's hardly any manual labour at all. It's all done with winches and hydraulics. We pump a fish aboard at uh, like 16 tonne a minute, we can pump, pump fish aboard. And uh, there's no manual labour at all now, hardly, in, in the fishing industry. What is indisputable is that there are less fish and that some species have all but disappeared. Where opinions divide is why, overfishing or natural cycles. Different opinions prevail. There is a definite subsidised drive towards bigger catches and bigger fishing vessels, which combined with seemingly unwanted efforts to regulate the industry is having a very negative effect on the marine environment worldwide. A balance needs to be found with our ocean's environment, whilst sustainable conservation and fishing methods need to be implemented. Climate change too is having its effect. The sea temperature is said to have risen two degrees and as a consequence different warm water fish are now found in the North Sea. There's different fish in the areas now because in my opinion it's been a change in water temperature. I mean we get squid here and sea bass which are uh, warm water fish, mullet in the Yorkshire coast and we see a lot more uh, Norway lobsters which is the biggest uh, fishery in the UK now. One of the greatest and most pervasive threats to the marine environment is fisheries bycatch, the unwanted catch in a trawl net. Many fisheries are catching more unwanted species than intended. Sadly, the smaller cetaceans can also become bycatch. Within the Moray Firth, it is the harbour porpoise that most frequently is the accidental victim. 
In complex ecosystems, actions and their effects are never simple. A combination of different actions and influences may eventually bring about a change. This change is never